So this, uh, this, uh, <laughs> this chapter you're going to read to us, it's called uh, uh, Tiny well, White Coffin, right? It's called Tiny White Coffin because yeah. uh, one time I saw a tiny white coffin and it struck me as, as one of the saddest um, images I'd ever seen. <coughs> so anyways, the story is about, this is just the end of the story, but at the start of the story, it's, a, it's about a, a child. When you're a celebrity of any sort, people want things from you, especially terminally ill children. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, there was a Make-A-Wish a uh, Foundation, and this child wanted me, he wanted to come to SNL. Natural. And, and then watch me um, throughout the week and see how uh, an idea became a sketch. So I said, okay, that, that's a wonderful idea. And uh, I uh, talked to him at his bedside, and I, I got everybody else to scram, you know. And uh, I was saying how, t how touched I was that he, he uh, wanted to do that. And then he said, I don't want to do that. I just made that up. I haven't uh, liked uh, SNL since Bill Murray left. So I said, well, what, what, what's, what do you want me for? He said, well, do you have your Canadian citizenship still? And I said, yes, I'm Canadian, you know. And uh, he said, well, that helps my wish. My wish is to kill a baby seal. <laughs> <laughs> so we took him, you know, me and my buddy. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> we went to Gander, Newfoundland, where we, uh, where we uh, uh, got the, the services of uh, Edward McClintock, a cod fisherman. And he took us to the flow, and, uh, and uh, we, we found the, um, we found, you know, and a boy had a, a, a terrible cough, you know. And uh, Edward McClintock said he's not going to make it through the North Atlantic. <laughs> And I said, but his final wish, you know. But I worried about the boy, you know. <laughs> so many pills. <laughs> but we tried, I tried to entertain him. Uh, we would sit and we'd look. The sky is so beautiful and limitless when you get to the, uh, these super northern places. And we'd look at the clouds, uh, the boy and I, and we try to find figures in them, you know, like I go, that cloud looks like a half-eaten pickle. <laughs> <laughs> the boy had not learned that life was about food yet. <laughs> so he saw other things, you know, he would go, look, there's a man with a beard. And I'd say, I don't see it. And he'd go, wait, see where the, that's his mouth. And then that's his chin. I go, yes, it is a man with a beard. Right, you are. And, you know, and I go, what about that one? It's an alligator. He goes, I instantly, I see that it's an alligator. So we both saw an alligator, and on it went. So uh, <laughs> finally, uh, we get to the, we hear the, the yeah, odd noise I'd never heard, and uh, Edward McClintock said, harp seal. Yeah. Baby harp. Uh, so he said, oh, God, thank God, because we've been on the sea for a couple of days. And uh, <laughs> we go, and, and uh, then you, we heard gunshots. And uh, Edward McClintock said, uh, damn punks from St. John's with their revolvers. That's not how you kill a seal. <laughs> and we said, well, how do you kill him? Uh, and, and he produced uh, a, a rucksack. And out of the rucksack was this medieval-looking sort of thing. It was called a hack-a-pick. Hack-a-pick. And uh, Edward McClintock gave instructions to the boy. And he said, uh, uh, he said, uh, a seal's skull is as thin as a shadow by. <laughs> Strike him with this hack-a-pick directly above the eyes and watch as they go glassy. So the boy ran away. <laughs> no, he didn't run away, but he ran toward ran the, toward the, toward the harp seal, seal. Toward, the, toward the baby harp. And um, 
and me and Edward McClintock and my buddy stood there, and, and he was he had such strength suddenly, this, this child, <laughs> and he struck as hard as he could, and the blood came out. It was, uh, it was so red with the white behind it, you know. Just this fountain of blood, and so, most of it hit the boy's uh, face and within his mouth, and, and it was almost like the life of the seal itself was transferring <laughs> there to the child. And then me and my friend and Edward McClintock, we just stood and watched this wicked miracle unfold. <laughs> And on our way back, we were all <laughs> depressed and we couldn't get the image out of our mind. <laughs> Except for the boy who sang gay songs. <laughs> I gave him his pills and he threw them in the North Atlantic. <laughs> he didn't want the pills. And we went back and a, a miracle had happened. The, the boy was free of his uh, uh, disease. It, it was like a, it was in the New York newspapers <laughs> at the time. This was about 18 years ago. And uh, he, 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 he got a small measure of fame for it. And he, he got to go to Gracie Mansion. And he met the mayor. And uh, he was on uh, the Donahue program. Mm. <laughs> cured. Phil Donahue program. Cured, yeah. It was a, there, were oh. other, there were other people with him that had been cured and so forth. He didn't, he didn't, it was, remained a secret of how he was cured. But, um, and it was barely mentioned a year later when he was struck by a city bus and killed. <laughs> so anyways... Is that... That's... <laughs> so that's where we pick up the story. Yes, we pick up Thank the story. Thank you. Because <laughs> I thought that page would be too long to read. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this is the this is the thing. This is the story. <coughs> the boy had turned ten years old only a few days before the accident, and now he lay in Strickland's funeral home in a tiny white coffin. When all the strangers had finished looking at him and sadly shaking their heads, so that all present knew their feelings on the matter, his mother was left alone in the room with the tiny white coffin, alone but for me. I lingered behind unseen while the funeral director shooed the others into a room with a sad-faced pastor who was preparing to speak. The mother stood and looked down into the tiny white coffin. Her posture, which had been rigid all morning, went slack at the shoulder and neck. Her hands remained clasped tightly in front of her. The boy was wearing a navy blue suit with a white shirt and a tie but he still did not look like a man. I stayed quiet in the shadows so as not to disturb the moment. After a time had passed, the funeral director opened the door and quietly let the mother know that her time was up. As she turned to leave, she looked one last time into the tiny white coffin, and then she did a strange thing, a thing that I shall never forget. She straightened the knot on the boy's tie and looked to make sure that it was correct. I took in a fast, jagged gulp of air and slunk into the next room before she noticed me. There were cookies and an urn of coffee on a table in the room. The cookies were awful. None of the cookies contained jelly in the middle, <laughs> which are widely considered to be the best funeral home cookies. <laughs> Instead, there were only dry shortbreads. The coffee was black, and there was no cream or milk, just packets of white-yellow powder. When I poured the powder into a styrofoam cup of black, bitter coffee, it just sat in a pile on the top. When I mixed the powder in, using a black plastic stick, the coffee turned gray like dishwater. It got me pretty steamed. <laughs> And I'm sure the rest of the people who had gathered felt the same way. <laughs> we all went into the adjoining room and took our seats. The tiny white coffin 
had been placed in the front of the room, and a sad-faced pastor was standing beside it. The sad-faced pastor told us how the boy had not been an ordinary boy. He had been very special. He had been a brother and a son and a grandson and even a great-grandson. I looked over and saw them sitting there, the young and the old and the older and the oldest. The sad-faced pastor told us that some things were very mysterious, but that there was a meaning behind everything, even something as tragic as this. He then asked if anyone had anything they would like to say about the boy. And people came up, one at a time, to speak about the boy. I decided to go up to speak too, since I had experience in public speaking. <laughs> of course, I wasn't about to do my stand-up. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> I pulled out the piece of paper with a speech I had prepared. And then, just when I was about to read it, I suddenly changed my mind. Folks, I said, I have in my hand here a speech I wrote, a speech that's full of big, fancy words. But I'm not going to read it. And I crumpled out my speech and threw it to the floor with contempt. You don't want to hear a bunch of fancy words, many of them so fancy you wouldn't even understand them. <laughs> Instead, I will speak from the heart. I have never done such a thing before, but I hear it can be quite effective. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, bereaved relatives, youngsters who have lost a brother or a sister or a friend, the guy in the sad-faced pasture costume, <laughs> <laughs> the lady sitting beside him, I figure it's his wife or something, and finally, of course, the guy hanging around at the door wearing a Carolina Panthers jacket. <laughs> he is clearly in the wrong room, but has the grace to hang in there until the end. <laughs> I thank you all for coming. I was proud to have known this boy, and I was proud that his last wish in life was to see me do a sketch on the Saturday Night Live program. Although I cannot say I was all that surprised. I'm a very good sketch player. But this is not about me. <laughs> I really shouldn't be making it about me, but this is the first time I've ever spoken from the heart. <laughs> so I beg your indulgence. I feel this speech will really start to get good very soon. <laughs> but it didn't. <laughs> and I realized something during the next 20 minutes. As my speech moved from one inane anecdote to another, none of them having anything to do with the boy. <laughs> what I realized then was that some guys are very good at speaking from the heart, and some guys just aren't. Doesn't mean one guy's better than the other. <laughs> just different. So I was honest with the people. Ladies and gentlemen, I said, I apologize for this speech. For the last five or six minutes, I've been telling you about Gordie Howe. <laughs> and I think we all know what an awful, awful mistake me speaking from the heart was. So, if I may ask your help, let's try to find that speech. You know, the one with the big fancy words that I threw away some minutes ago. It's got to be around here somewhere. Here it is, a sweet old lady near the front said. I read it and thought it was very good, especially the part about how we can learn more from the children than they can learn from us. Oh, excellent, I said. I'm glad you liked that part because it's the surprise ending. <laughs> So that shot, <laughs> so I'll just have to read it without the surprise ending. And there appears to be coffee spilled all over it. Oh yes, the sweet old lady said, I spilled coffee all over the darn thing. Okay, well, I can't make out any of the big fancy words now at all. But it's nobody's fault. I mean, in all fairness, part of it is my fault for crumpling it up and tossing it away so cavalierly. 
Hey, you know, I think cavalierly might have been one of the big fancy words in my speech. <laughs> also, it's partly the sweet old lady's fault for spilling so much coffee on the paper that not a single word can be made out. But we're not here to place blame. <laughs> I will say this about the young boy in the tiny white coffin. Despite the doctor's dire predictions, the boy was too tough, too resolute, too courageous to let something as small as a deadly disease defeat him. No, the boy was made of stronger stuff than that, and it took much more to defeat him. It took a three-ton municipal bus, <laughs> moving at 40 miles per hour, and driven by one Cecil Richard Anderson <laughs> to defeat this boy. <laughs> I heard the deepest of sobs and looked down to see a man wearing some sort of bus driver's uniform <laughs> and being held up by two women. If you cry, sir, I said, then cry with envy and not pity, for the boy is in the clouds and he is one with the clouds. It is we who are left, who are reminded on this unacceptable day that life is swift and yet we are blind to its mighty splendor which can be found in the simplest of things. Things like a walk in the park, a conversation with a good friend, a deep, rich coffee leavened with half cream and half milk, <laughs> and served in a sturdy mug, <laughs> one with some heft, and with it, a delicious cookie <laughs> that's white and has red jelly in the middle. <laughs> Thank you for listening, and due to the solemnity of the occasion, I would ask you to hold your applause. <laughs> From there, we all went to the graveyard. The day was bright and clean, and the cool autumn air filled my lungs and made me feel healthy. A time passed, and then the hearse showed up. The pallbearers were all big then, and they carried the tiny white coffin as if it was very heavy, although it could not have weighed more than 80 or 90 pounds. There was a small hole in the ground and some dirt beside it. We stood in a circle and a sad-faced pastor said some things in Latin and then we formed a line. The sun was directly overhead and made the tiny white coffin ever so bright and I took a handful of dirt and flung it down on top. Then it was the next guy's turn. Afterward, I walked back alone down a long black top road, and it was cold, and in the sky there were white clouds, and they all looked like white clouds and nothing else. I saw that book for the first time on, on your coffee oh, table, rather, covered in. Knock me out that story. You, you, you're upset. Well, no, I, uh, you know, something like that happened to me. But anyways, on we go. 